said your fans have a difference of opinion. But Dave Chappelle was decapitated in front of us. And until we deal with that, until we deal with um, <laughs> the fact that a devout Muslim who doesn't eat bacon was accused of being a crackhead, until we, until we <laughs> establish the fact that they said that he went to Africa to smoke cocaine when we know they don't have running water and food over there, when they don't have paved roads over there. You saying he flew past Chicago and Miami and LA and New York and Detroit. You saying he went past Cleveland and Fort Pierce, Florida, and he went past Okeechobee and Oakland. You said he went to there. another country yeah, where they're not smoke. eating. Right. You talking about somebody who has a wife and children, five children, and lives on a farm, doesn't live here in Hollywood. You saying you oh, yeah. convinced people that person wow. was an insane crackhead wow. and he hasn't been on movies and TV for eight years? Is that correct? Wow. Okay, then don't tell me about what you want to tell me about. I just watched you decapitate the king in front of me and then act like he's supposed to catch up and be a regular comedian wow. like everybody else, but no. He didn't go for that. That's not how I went. He was out there with us for 20 years. They called him Pilot Boy because he had 19 pilots in Hollywood and everybody passed on him and said his show wasn't worth it. What do you think of Then when he man? made $500 million, yeah. They said, even though his contract said he should get half of it, they said he made too much for the contract to be valid. So we'll offer you 10% of what you made. You mean he made 500 million and they offered him 50? Yes. And he said, what do you think my fans are gonna say when they find out you offered me 10% of what I made you? And they said, your fans will believe that you're a crazy crackhead by the time you get home. And my nigga got on the flight in LA and by the time he got to Ohio, it was wow. so. And eight years later, he hasn't been in a movie and or television. Is just now trying to do his real comeback at Radio City Music Hall. It bees like that sometimes. So now you can be the fake king or you can be the real king, but heavy is the head. Peace, family. This is the Hood Mystic representing www.hoodmystic.com here with another video. The title of this video is The Joker and the Mystery of the Sacred Clown. Now, this video comes after a lot of successful things that really have shown me the sacred clown whether it be comedy specials from dave chappelle and bill burr whether it be these recent string of clown movies it chapter two the joker a lot of things have been said about these artistic expressions whether critically politically or socially what i'm attempting to do is look at the mythology and the esoterics and the history of the sacred tradition. And as we know, energy does not die. It is just transferred into a different space and different time. So with this understanding, we're able to look at the energy and reference it with past histories to get a better understanding. It is often said, if you don't understand your history, or you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. So the ultimate purpose for this actual documentary is for you to understand when someone is speaking against the status quo and they're using humor or jest to explain a point, it's not wise to cancel them or just to write them off as crazy, nor is it to champion a person who has a mask. And I say that in reference to the recent Joker movie. So ultimately, I'll be talking about some history, some esoterics, and also current events. So I hope you gain something from this message as well as learn some history and maybe get some information that you may have not heard before. So let's just get into this conversation. Throughout civilization, throughout history, there's always been a clown, a trickster, a fool, a court jester, a buffoon. These are many names for what we can understand today as the modern clown. But that clown just didn't come out of the want or desire to entertain children and get children to laugh. This actually is an ancient mythological practice that has been seen in medieval Europe, Africa, Native American, Aztec, and Mayan cultures in all points in between. 
All of these cultures celebrate what we call as a clown character in some form or fashion. Now, the court jester or the sacred clown was usually given great freedom of freedom of speech. He was the one who could speak out against the chief or the ruler and speak negatively to their ideas. And through this humor, it's what is in most writings that I've read on this. It created like a safe valve so people could express how they feel in an oppressive system without being vilified. And the way that they do it is through humor, get you to laugh about the paradoxes and the things that are oxymoronic within society. And so through this modality, these actual tricksters were venerated throughout society, whether you talk about tribal Native Americans or Western African Ifa and Yoruba traditions with the understanding of Ishu, the understanding of Odin in Nordic mythology. And the list can just go on and on and on and on about these particular trickster figures or psychopomps that actually take you on the spiritual path. But the lesson that they teach is humor or laughter. To understand this dynamic, we have to understand how words could be used to simply dismantle all public opinions. The clown's role was to use the words that we use every day and rearrange them in a way that now you saw the world in the way that you live differently. Now, this may sound complicated, but to bring it down to modern terms, just think about a comedian or a rapper. A rapper is not co creating a language. Well, some, some rappers are. I don't need to rap no more. I can just use my ad libs. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> all right well it's definitely the most unique freestyle experience we've ever had that's the most that's the most different that's the most that's the who influenced that's, you bro where's your influences from i don't know what just happened man um some rappers are <laughs> but also he's using the language that we know and he's teaching us or showing us different ways to put words together, whether through different rhyme parameters, double entendres, et cetera, and so forth. And even when we think about the modern comedian or modern rapper, they're allowed to express things that you wouldn't necessarily normally do. Whether a rapper is talking about how much money they have or how many girls they have or how many people they shot, or the comedian is saying the most crazy craziest jokes about his relationship or about his children these are seen as jokes and they may have some truth in it but you couldn't necessarily do the things that they're saying so within this space they'll say that they actually do it and the more believable they are the more credible they become and the more successful they are and it's not they are credible by their actions because if they were credible by their actions, they'd probably be in prison or in a mental institution. But if they are able to convince you through words, they are celebrated. So now the dominant society, they tend to hold a dominant perspective. And whenever you step outside of that in the form of action, you get ostracized. So what a trickster does is actually use his brain and his words to tiptoe that line and go outside of that dominant narrative while being in the same paradigm that he's actually speaking against. So many rappers speak about injustices, but have contracts to record labels that are owned by the CIA. So many comedians speak against whatever, but they're a part of the establishment or doing movies for the establishment that they speak against. So. We don't necessarily know who's for the cause or who's against the cause based upon the art form of being a trickster. And this is through riddles, jokes, poetry, rhyme, and overall creative expression. So the overall art form of the trickster is supposed to reverse the status of the dominant society 
destroy the oppressive society structure. So whether they do this or not still remains to be seen. But in ancient mythology, the trickster is a mere character or a personification of secret knowledge or intellect. And this knowledge remains above your current reality. So it could seem like your mind is playing tricks on you or forces you just to go outside of your boundaries or societal norms. I think the Ghetto Boys had a song called My Mind Is Playing Tricks On Me, which is your mind playing tricks on you. But since human beings like to personify and put particular human characteristics on things that we can't understand, the personification of information that stays beyond our grasp or beyond our reality. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of things that will lead me up to my final point in my actual critical review of the movie Joker. But it starts here in Native American religious concepts. So the first religious concept that I'm going to deal with is the Hyoka, which is a sacred energy that is, quote unquote, said to rattle the cages of complacency, said to rattle our mundane lives, which represents a mirror that reflects our actions. And this is no different from the Orisha issue in art. They are shown the Hyoka rather are shown to be riding a horse backward. And this is symbolizing the attempt to turn things back so they can reveal hidden truths. The Hyoka is there to remind us that we tend to take our lives too seriously and it's easy to lighten up and lighten that load by laughing. In Hopi tribes, there's another concept of the clown Kachina and they provided amusement during Kachina ceremonies and often shown with watermelons. And this is not so different from the minstrel stereotype. They behave unusually and tend to lead the drumming for all tribal dances. The Hayoka and the Clown Kachinas, they are both thought as moving backwards and forwards, upside down. And this is just symbolizing that they represent a contrary to our normal nature. So let me give you some examples of the tribal context of the Hayoka. If food is scarce, a Hayoka may sit around the tribe and complain about how full he is. During a heat wave, he might cover up with a heavy blanket and shiver. Then when it's cold, he might wander around naked complaining that he's too hot. So what they do is what is called a sacred clownship, and this is called a straighten outer. And so what this does for the indigenous mind or the ancient mind is remind them that their good or bad is not related to Christian concepts of the invader. And although Hayoka translate to a sacred clown, it is much, much more than that. Because this sacred calling can't happen to just anybody. It has to happen from those who get the particular dream. And when they get the dream, they begin to show people different things. And the problem, uh, the problem when you show people different things is that they call you crazy. So it's not that the Hayoka are crazy. It's just that you are trapped in your mundane nature and can't see anything left or right from you. So there's also a movie about this actual science and it's by Robin Williams and it's called Patch Adams. And there's also a scene in the Joker that relates to this where the Joker is in a hospital with children and he's dancing, doing his clown thing to heal them, which speaks to the Patch Adams thing where he is said to quote unquote cure kids from cancer by dressing up as a clown and making them laugh. Well, the Hyoka is a source of wisdom and healing for the tribe. I say all that to say that in the Joker, his name is Arthur Fleck and the etymology for Fleck is patch i thought that was interesting so in the realms of reality nothing is sacred to a sacred clown because he looks at life in totality he does not look at the dominant society he does not look at uh, colonialism history in the context of what the dominant society says history is it has a way to connect to the history of the galaxies and the history of the universe. And within that, he may look at the world and see all of these automatons and think, 
these people have really lost their way. So in instead of standing on a pulpit or being extra serious, it tries to show you that you're going about things in the wrong way through humor. And this is something that is hard for us to deal with because we may look at these people as crazy clowns and they don't have anything valuable to say. In the days before the invaders came, we had clowns. Not clowns like you see now, with round noses and baggy costumes. Our clowns wore all kinds of stuff. Anything they felt like, they wore. And they didn't just come out once in a while to act silly and make people laugh. Our clowns were with us all the time. As important to the village as the chief or the shaman or the dancers or the poets. To the colonizers of this country, the sacred clown was the most dangerous office based on their influence of public opinion. A warrior can be killed in battle, while a sacred clown could influence uprisings and revolts with mere words. Here's another quote from the Cree medicine woman who says, no wonder we never got along. My people and your people, they were all the time getting peeved at each other and much hatred grew between us. It was unavoidable because my people had great pride and humor. Yours had the jitters and wanted to shoot those who were laughing at them. Yet I still find you people very amusing. I have to laugh at you because you never let yourself go. Every word to you is completeness or else a long way off. You like to bludgeon the meaning of something to fit your own stupidity. It would serve you well to quit being so brittle. So these sacred clowns were dangerous to tyrants and colonizers because they had disorder. They dressed any type of way and they were also honest. You couldn't just show them anything. They saw with the eyes of the child and they seen the truth within the lies. And this is also a close comparison to the Orisha, Legwa and Ishu. So the invaded army of this country, they hated the sacred clown more than they hated the warrior for this reason. And this is why that the sacred clown is not even a normal conversation that we would have, even though we'll have things like Comic View and Deaf Comedy Jam and Cat Williams and all of these different things. We don't understand the origination or the purpose of it. All we know is that we want to laugh. And this is how the tricksters learn to change their form. And a lot of them had to become invisible. And when they did become invisible, this allowed a new particular energy, AKA the dominant society to take up this tradition. And like with all other things that they take up, they like to dis <laughs> they like to distort it and change it up to be something that it originally wasn't to have us now look at the art form as some form of buffoonery or something for children when actually it is something that allows us to connect to our ancestors. So let's deal with the aspect of deindividuation. Now, if you listen to this channel, you know that I love the concept of individuation, which states that we are individuals and we have to learn ourselves and we are not predicated by our groups and our families and our associations. We can't live off of that because those things are purely by chance and purely by our particular environments. So here we have the individuation, which is actually a space where everything that you are is your group, whether it is consciousness, church, uh, race, sex. It's like, since I'm a part of this group, Whatever this group mandates, I have to stand behind. And this is the opposite of individuation. This is de-individuation. And this is the state of mind that a lot of people are in. So when it comes to particular energies or individuals who don't speak along with the dominant narrative, they would easily be crossed off as evil. But then you have to really figure out who's the ones that are calling who evil. Is it the dominant society calling me evil after it does literally chew me up and spit me out? 
and now I'm the evil one? Or is it that it's a nice way to do a role reversal? So there are specific situations that make nearly all people engage in behavior that would be considered quote unquote evil. Evil behavior as we know it happens in a state of de-individuation, a state in which one's identity is hidden. Researchers have found that de-individuated individuals are more likely to hurt others, cheat, steal, lie, and even kill under such conditions. De-individuation is a tool of warfare to take away the individuality of the soldier, and this will make it okay to kill the enemies. A soldier in a uniform is going to behave completely different than he would if he were in civilian clothes. So this is when a person is de-individuated. He's allowed to be at his worst. He's allowed to exemplify his worst behaviors. And so this study, this psychological study of de-individuation allows researchers to come up with a number of phenomena that often seem unrelated, but they are often clearly related based upon the fact that individuals can act under the banner of a particular concept, albeit white supremacy, the government, etc., so forth and so on, and act in a way that shows their worst characters. But if you met them alone, you know, James Snyder, he's the nicest guy. But when he has on his mask or his regalia, he turns into MK Ultra Soldier number one. And this is all related to de-individuation and how technology allows people to really get into their bag, really get into their funk. And the reason that they're able to do that is because when you see them riding down or you see them at Kroger's, it's like, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good. And then when they get in their computers or on their phone, it's like kill, 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 murder, murder, murder. And so this within itself is why the clown is designed to be a de-individuated person. So where we may look at a clown as a thing to make children laugh, it is now evolved into a mercenary soldier. And I know that makes no sense, but if you watch the movie Joker, then this concept should slowly make sense to you. Because a clown is generally known not for who he is as a person, but for the mask that he wears. And the individuation is an aspect specifically targeted to group think. It's the way that people are usually focused on particular conformity or a line of thought, and you can't say anything outside of the talking points. So within that space, you end up making rash, problematic decisions that do not promote unity within, but they actually promote divisiveness because you are unpredictable based upon your group. Now, all blame for all decision making and action is not attributed to the person who was a Ku Klux Klan member, it's just attributed to the Ku Klux Klan as a whole. We don't know who the members of Illuminati, we just know that the Illuminati exist and there are particular members. But the power of a grouping or branding yourself, if one might say, it allows for people to come up under that banner and act in the most vilest and most vilest of ways. And so the same way that people get under particular gangs and they act a particular certain type of way, but then when they get out of the gang lifestyle, it's like, I would never treat my brother like that. I love my brothers. It's all about peace, harmony. But if I see another person wearing a red rag and I wearing a blue rag, I might have to get out of my character a little bit because I signed up for it based on the space of de-individuation. I can no longer be James Franco anymore or Thomas Jones. I have to be a blood. I have to be a crit. And this is not just gang warfare. This is social media. And what has happened as a result of quote unquote social media, it turned you into an antisocial person. De-individuation is a problem within itself. It shrinks personal responsibility 
and it also allows people to just be and do whatever and this is what happened in the movie where you have this man who's doing hella foul stuff but since we know his backstory we want to empathize with them and this is another trick that the dominate the dominant media utilizes against the not so dominant media into getting them lighter sentences or just overall empathy or hero you know they can turn into a hero where if the situation was on the other foot you would get wrote off immediately upon hearing that you've done something bad and i find that the joker really resonates with an actual current event that's happening but i'll get into that so once you're to kind of finish up this de-individuation process because i think this is the largest part of understanding the movie and if you can understand this part then you can kind of understand what was happening throughout the movie uh if you haven't seen the movie you probably don't want to watch this video because i'm gonna probably vicariously spoil the movie for you but if if you have saw the movie there is a particular point at the end not giving too much away where the joker is sitting with a radio host and the joker makes a joke and the lady says oh no you can't joke about that <laughs> right she she says it so clearly as a form of social commentary to say there are certain things you can talk about and there are certain things that you can't and the joker <laughs> took it 10 steps further said since i can't talk about it i'll do something about it but even more so to tie it all in together the trickster clown jester these are the modern day comedians who have historically poked fun at the powerful dominant society now this used to be fine you know we had comedians people like george carlin richard pryor uh the list goes on and on paul mooney of comedians that spoke to the powers that be even to the likes of moms mabley red fox uh sammy davis jr i mean i could just go on and on and on about the comedians that spoke truth to power some of them walked that line very well some of them crossed over and you know got ostracized one one person that comes to mind is cat williams and how people kind of speak to him and treat him based upon his level of just saying things that the dominant culture just doesn't like. And so when you say stuff like this, it 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 brings up a lot of discomfort in people who are have now based upon the media have become completely de-individuated. We've all fallen into a hashtag whether we're Black Lives Matter, Me Too, LGTB, and so forth and so on. And nothing's wrong with these groups within itself, but this is a commentation, commentation on the actual culture and why do we have to fall into these groups? And within these groups, we don't have a say with the actual conversation. We have to join these groups and follow in lockstep. So when they say that we have to cancel this person, we all have to cancel it. So nobody can listen to Michael Jackson anymore. Nobody can listen to R. Kelly. Nobody can, you know, watch the Cosby show any longer because the dominant society said that these people are bad and no longer can we support them. But when these people were making us millions, if not billions of dollars, you could support them to your fingers turn blue but now that they aren't such a cash cow now we have turned our 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 hate towards them so what a political commentator does is that he takes all of this energy and instead of speaking into it so what you have is a lot of people on youtube who see these issues right they look at them and they get enraged and uh, you know, it's countless of YouTubes that speak about injustices and get blackballed and shadow banned. And I'm probably one of those goddamn pages. But the idea 
is that we cannot go about it in an angry, angry, fighting, scratching way. Even if we do do that, we have to incorporate the sacred clown. Because this is something that we need as a society, as a culture. There's something that happens within the brain when we laugh. I could even get into a study from uh, the Lieber No, uh, Philip Hines book, where he speaks on laughter as being the supreme emotion to have as a human being or as a magical process, laughter. So when you think about this society, you think about news story after news story, it's kind of hard to laugh. It's kind of hard to smile, but somebody's laughing about it. Somebody's smiling about it. And so that's where we can get into and talk about the movie. But before we do that, I want to talk about Dave Chappelle and his and his comedy special, Sticks and Stones. To me, this is a modern day example of how the trickster who was once idolized, canceled and now idolized again, showing how you can rise from the ashes like a phoenix. No different from the main character of the Joker, Jaqueen Phoenix, and what Dave Chappelle was able to do with his latest comedy special was speak to the dominant narrative in a way that had people think about the dominant narrative in a different way. And so this made a lot of people uncomfortable. Now, this whole past three months, I cannot tell if life is imitating art or art is imitating life. What I do know is that Dave Chappelle did his thing he talked he said jokes about the lgbt community the me too movement the current opioid crisis and just a whole whole bunch of stuff that made people cringe now these diamond now these dominant ideas have been just moving along across media full steam ahead with little restriction and when you do speak to things that you may be uncomfortable with you could get restricted, uh, shadow banning, your channel can get demonetized. So in that space, you feel as a creator that you could only talk about certain things and certain things are taboo and certain things you just can't say. Well, that didn't apply to Dave Chappelle. He went straight in for the juggler. And so what he did was what a trickster would do, what a fool would do or what a court jester would do. Now, if you were to act out these things, you would definitely get penalized. Like I couldn't say the things that he said in just a straightforward way, but what he was able to do is utilize the modality of humor to get his message across. And this indicates his genius. And this allows the dominant narratives to not take such a strong root in our minds and allows you and other people to begin to think differently. Now, I feel that Dave Chappelle's role in this was to provide some form of social commentary, provide some form of opinion that was contrary to the dominant narrative. And not only was he going to do it like on his small YouTube channel or something like that, but no, he was on Netflix where people all over the world were able to watch this and they can watch it over and over again. So in that space is not controlled by the dominant narrative. And this makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Because we now live in a culture that tells you whatever makes you uncomfortable is bad. But what Dave showed is that there is a particular value in being uncomfortable. Now, most of his jokes went towards the dominant race and to its politics. And then, even though he was speaking in such a bombastic way, he had the jokes and the humor to make you laugh. And that really softened the blow and allowed him to come off with a particular strong and powerful performance. Now, Daniel Butler expresses that what people do when they invoke dog whistles like cancel culture and culture wars is just illustrate their discomfort with the kinds of people who now have a voice. And now they feel as though they have an audacity to direct it towards the figures with more visibility and power. But this is what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just go along with the normal schedule, scheduled programs and live our lives in fear. We are supposed to speak truth to power because these are how things are changed. Now, 
the role of the modern day trickster is what Dave Chappelle did, what Bill Burr did, uh, what George Carlin does when he was living. You know, these are modern day tricksters, the ones who have platforms, but no longer are linked to the dominant society. And they're able to just say what they need to say, do what they need to do. Uh, we have to look at the entertainment industry different from what it once was to what it is now where anybody can have a voice anybody can have a following and you know back in the days were only three channels and if they didn't want you on those three channels it was over but now we live in a time where they just can't blackball you completely you know and so the way that they blackball you now is through the individuation and getting a whole bunch of people to hate you so within them trying to do that to dave chappelle I honestly feel they failed miserably because he came through with a commercial success and also a critical success. I think what needs to be established from here on out is the discernment between who is a trickster and who is a white faced clown. And a lot of people don't know the difference between the two. So I'm going to attempt to break this down. This was one of the most challenging researches that I had to do, but hopefully as I break down the theater aspect to the trickster, then we can kind of understand what this recent movie, The Joker, was speaking to. Comedia del Art was performed outdoors in temporary venues by professional actors who were costume and masked. The symbol of the Comedia del Art was the Roman god Janus who symbolized both the comings and goings of this traveling troupe and also the dual nature of the actor who impersonates the other. You can also understand the symbol of Janus in the smiling mass and the sad mass and this whole relationship to the actor or to the clown or to whoever portrays these roles is that comedy and tragedy are no different. The only difference is the reaction that you get from your audience. You could say the same story, but change the tune, change the tone and change the mood and you get a completely different reaction. So where if you have this set up in your mind that it's a comedy, then it's funny. But if you have it set up in your mind that it's a drama, then it's a drama. The interesting thing about the movie The Joker is that I kind of went in there with this idea that I wasn't going to be emotionally involved in it, that I was going to laugh because I was literally going in to watch a clown movie. And what they did was really utilize the role reversal of the sad clown and the happy clown where you can't hardly tell the difference. Now, within the Commedia del Art, there are three stock characters. One is called the first zany, the next is called the second zany, and then the third is called the Francesca. Now, I'm going to save this for later in the talk, but I just want you to remember this for when we reference the Harlequins. Now, I bring this up because the Commedia del Art is where we have the origins to the modern white face clown. Now, the modern white face clown is an evolution of the black face clown from the minstrel shows the wide red or white mouth painted on and you know all of these different things is just a remnant of the black face minstrel tradition so now we have to come to a point of understanding that the minstrel and the acceptance of it in black culture is not based upon the degradation of black culture but is actually a component of traditional tribal life so what i'm trying to say is in 2019, we may look at the minstrel as something degrading or in, even though it possibly was degrading. But at that particular time, it was just a mere tradition that sometimes we laugh at stuff. And the main thing we laugh at is ourselves and our behavior and how we act. And from that laughter, we're able to look at ourselves in a different way and change. Now. The blackface clown is more in line with the older traditions and the tribal traditions of the Native Americans, the African, medieval European, ancient, Euro ancient Egyptian, Mesoamerican, 
And so the social function of the clown was to be an outsider or an other or somebody that was different. And because he was different, he was allowed to say and do things that nobody else could. As the court jester, he could just satirize and make political comments and telling the king rude truths that no one else dare utter. See, these are the roots of satire and parody, and this was central to comedy and minstrelsy. And this is all bringing us to the Harlequin. So there's a fictional DC Universe character named Harley Quinn, who is the lover of the Joker. And her name is a play on the name Harlequin, which is a character that was originated in the earlier mentioned Commedia del Art. Now, the Harlequin takes the role of the second Zanny, which is the victim. So they have a first Zanny and a second Zanny and a Francesca. The second Zanny is the one who is not so smart to the first Zanny schemes. See, the first Zanny is the person who would be considered as Batman. And the second Zanny would be considered as the Joker. And the Francesca would be named as Harley Quinn. And so this is kind of the triad of what would be considered of a minstrel show. Now, you might have to digress a little bit because if you just really get to the root of it, what we are watching is a comic strip. And a comic strip is taken from the word comedy. So in utilizing these tropes and utilizing these particular archetypes, they are bringing forth that ancient tradition of the theater in modern times. And so if you understand this, then you can understand the story that they're trying to tell at a more esoteric level because the Harlequin's victims, one of his main victims was the white faced clown. And so this could be easily symbolized as the Joker. So let's just take this information and move into the movie and what I thought and try to tie all of this information all together. So the Joker is a 2019 film that speaks to a lot of the themes presented in this documentary. The symbolism in this movie is centered in fighting back against an invading race of people. Now the ways that the dominant society rules us is based on popular opinion. So in knowing this, the Joker started off the movie as a clown, evolved into a comedian, and then was finally introduced as a sacred clown or a trickster and a leader. Even if this all happened in his head, this still represents something that could possibly happen. Now what the movie attempted to do was evoke empathy for particular heinous acts that I will not get into into this documentary. You would just have to see the movie. And this ties into how deeply our culture is de-individualized. See, the same people who attempted to cancel Dave Chappelle will applaud the Joker based on the empathy that they felt for the character and the tone and the mood set in the movie. This way, the Joker represents dominant society's victim mentality and then how it laughs at things that are really not funny. And then it will laugh when it's really not necessary as well. Through this adversity and struggle is when laughter is needed, not when you're killing somebody. So this is another attempt of Hollywood to hijack ancient traditions and use it for their own residual perpetual purpose. Now, there are many themes that this movie highlighted with the hopes that you would evoke empathy behind it. This movie attempts to evoke praise when it should evoke investigation on what exactly is being said or what is trying to be said at the very least. The Joker's name in the movie, as mentioned earlier, was Arthur Fleck. Now, Fleck is a patch or a spot which could correlate to the many traditions being patched together to create this character. Author, like King Arthur, denotes that this person is a king in a position, even if you do not see it that way, because the, rep the, the energy of the trickster is that his rulership is hidden. The trickster's job is to remain hidden in plain sight, and this movie under close examination is a discourse to continue to act in a deep individualized way 
senselessly. And when you do something wrong, just laugh or cry about it and simply absolve yourself. Uniforms within their self de denote warfare in a group identity. There was a particular scene in the movie where the Joker walks into his love interest home. And this scene is closely resembling the Amber Geiger in Botham John incident. Even though the sentencing happened at the same time as the movie, where the sentencing happened October 3rd and the movie was released October 4th, I find it no coincidence that It Chapter 2 and The Joker re were released in consecutive months. And this is followed by the cop drama about a female cop being attacked by fellow officers titled Black and Blue that will be released later in the month of October. So, all in all, this movie perpetuates the theme of colonization. This theme is that everything must go, which is the opening scene of the movie the Joker is holding up a sign signifying that everything must go, and that's including the people. And then when he's running from somebody who stole a sign, it literally smacks you over the head with it, as we've seen in the opening scene and throughout the movie, everything must go. The true sacred clown, however, will not go away so easily and will always find ways to speak against the dominant perspective. All in all, the net effect of all of this is the reversal of the lion's status as the king of the jungle. In this way, the master's house is dismantled when his tools are turned against him. Henry Louis Gates Jr. This movie spoke to the impact of childhood trauma and how it brings us into a dream world. The African tradition of Yoruba teaches us about the energy of Olegwa, who is sometimes represented as a child and sometimes represented as an old man. He represents the beginning and end of life and the opening and closing of the paths in life. Sometimes he is known as a trickster and likes to play jokes on people. Olegwa is always mentioned first in any ceremony because without his permission, the doors to communication with with any other Orisha will stay closed. We want to deal with the trickster or sacred clown to overcome all forms of oppression from within and without. The sacred clown allows us to tap into our primordial nature and show that reality is held together by a very thin veil. The Joker is also a warrior in the same line as the traditional trickster. Warfare in a large part is a means of deception. By concealing your identity, which is the true sorcery and witchcraft, what we see around us now, you are able to hurt and damage people without them even knowing that it's you who did it. Our world, if seen by the ancestors, would be called evil within itself. So we really have to determine what we mean when we call things evil. The evil or the contrarian darkness to the already perceived light under this context can no longer be considered as such. The primordial darkness is our modality for creation. Modern media portrays this darkness as evil and perpetuates the dominant society's narrative subconsciously. The European deity Ishu Alegba represents the dual forces of good and evil. He is the deity that can bring humanity back from destruction, chaos, and despair. He understands both darkness and light. And if we all continue to have hope, he will guide us out of our despair. I hope this article was useful. I hope this video was useful. Please share this video. Follow my blog for more articles and content. And be sure to check out my recent book, How to Read Your Natal Charts Easily and Effectively, now available on Amazon.